Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger for thousands of appetizing ingredients that inspire countless mouth-watering meals. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week and up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with points. So you can get big flavors and big savings. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash campaign to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash campaign. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be. To be. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Rival Recon here on Anfield Index Pro. I'm Harry Sethi. The Reds' fine form continued last weekend as they overcame a formidable Brighton side at Anfield, on Saturday evening. Arneslot's side then made light work of Xabi Alonso's Bayer Leverkusen in the Champions League, beating a side that had only lost two of their previous 60-odd games before, 4-0 at Anfield on Tuesday. Keen to maintain this momentum and their place at the top of the Premier League whilst their rivals appear to be faltering, Liverpool welcomed Aston Villa to Anfield on Saturday evening, with Unai Emery's side having lost three games on the bounce in all comps prior to this. Can the Reds continue their fine form and put down a marker to the rest of the league before the weekend? Well, joining me on the pod to discuss how the game may unfold and how Aston Villa's season has started so far, I'm happy to welcome back on Liverpool writer for The Athletic and host of the 1874 podcast, Greg Evans. Welcome back, Greg. Good to speak with you. Uh, thanks for having me on again. It's always good to talk, mate. We were chatting just before we hit record there just around... Uh, you bringing a unique perspective, obviously, to this uh, to this discussion. Obviously, yeah, on on this show, we, we we tend to be obviously focused on the opposition, what's going on in their world, their season. Uh, but you also covering Liverpool for the Athletic as well is going to give you a bit of unique insight into sort of what we can expect for this game, I suppose, as well. But before we get into anything to do with with Liverpool, um, I know we spoke like right towards the end of last season, I think, actually. Um, ahead of the penultimate game of the season. If I've misremembered that, it's my, it's my bad. But I, I think I spoke to you about sort of what your your views were on what was a historical season. I'm going to ask you to remind listeners about that as well, um, just taking your mind back to that final whistle goes, uh, final game of last season. Um, what were your feelings about the campaign? Yeah, uh, yeah, we we did speak about it at the back end of last season, and um, I said a similar thing back then. It felt like because Aston Villa had just lost the semi-final of the Europa Conference League, it felt like the season was ending in a bit of a disappointing manner, and the the performances that Villa put in towards the end of the season were really poor, actually, because they had lots of injuries. But it it was a case of. For so long uh, in the season, Villa supporters were just hoping that they could finally get over the line and, and get that fourth place nailed down, which they were able to do. Um, and then when the season finished, albeit in a slightly negative way, because they lost 5-0 away at Crystal Palace on the final day of the season, 
um, and were well and truly battered. <laughs> but uh, the the bigger picture was that what an incredible season it had been, and now Villa supporters are really enjoying this Champions League run. Yeah, no, of course, I think it's uh, not the first time Crystal Palace have have come up in these shows talking to different uh, sort of rival fans. I mean, we do have to caveat the fact that you know, you were beaten off it was Villa were beaten five 0 rather by the best side in Europe at at that point in time, given given where sort of the kind of football Palace were playing, which was extraordinary. Uh, yeah. And listeners to this show will know it was it was that win over Liverpool that sort of sparked off that late season run, um, and it's yeah, it was a remarkable set of performances and. You, know, you look at the the season on paper, as you said, Premier League finishing fourth, qualifying for the Champions League, getting to that semi final of the Europa Conference League, obviously, yeah, upsetting not to actually go the whole distance, especially with I suppose with Unai Emery and his experience in European competition, but um, a phenomenal campaign. Ollie Watkins having a like terrific season as well into his scoring form for the club. So many positive performances and players to sort of talk about who grew last season. It felt like. Uh, but I, I imagine you know, if you can think about you come off a season that that's, that's that successful, what were you thinking was necessary really for Villa to to do, whether it be transfers coming in or sort of like uh, you know, changes that Emery m- might have to make in order for that success to carry on into, into this season? We, we, we'll talk about transfers in a second, but like, what were the priorities for you? Yeah, I think the key was to slightly rebuild the squad to make sure that it was capable of sustaining a Premier League run and a champ- uh, so, sorry sustaining a Champions League run and maintaining a, um, a top four place in the Premier League or if not going one better now the owners Nassif Sawiris and Wes Edens when they took over the club in 2018 they had grand plans to take this club into Europe and then to even go on and win it again um, and you know we do hear this sometimes from, from, from ambitious owners but these two really believed that it could happen and part of the journey at Villa over the last six, seven, uh, last six years or so is that there has been steady improvement each year now I thought this year was going to be the most difficult for Villa because finishing fourth in the Premier League is is so hard to eclipse and I do firmly believe that Villa have got a better chance of winning the Champions League than finishing third in the Premier League now if you hear me out on this one I just think that over the course of the 38 game season it's harder for Aston Villa to be better than Liverpool, Arsenal and Manchester City um, whereas a Champions League run or you know a win even is incredibly difficult to, to do as well but it's, it's, there's a fewer amounts of games and the most of the games are not as hard as coming up against the real top teams in the Premier League so as fun as as fun and as exciting as it is for Villa supporters in the Champions League, Unai Emery and his team are really looking at this competition as one that they can actually go and win. Um, whether they would do that or not, you know, remains to be seen. I don't think they're quite good enough to do it, but internally there's a belief that they can. And the key for Villa really is now trying to maintain um, Champions League football. If they can finish in the top four again, that will be seen as a good season. Um, and then they can go into next season with renewed hope. Of course, so often what we do see from from sides that aren't used to being involved in Europe uh, in European competition to that extent. I'm not saying this is where where Villa have come from because of course there was there was European football last season as well, and you, you do get used to them that frequency. But the frequency with the Champions League and as you mentioned there, the inability to rotate as maybe you would do for the Conference League, um, just because of the quality of the teams that you're going to be facing in that competition. Uh, and no shortage of games, especially with this new this new format that's been rolled out as well. We'll come to talk about how things have gone in the Champions League so far. But you mentioned in order to do that, in order to make sure that you can compete in Europe whilst also having a strong league season, it was going to be padding out the squad that was really sort of needed to to be done. So I think that that takes us nicely into the transfer uh, business that happened in the summer. And it does outgoings. Um, some nice money raised in terms of Musa Diaby off to Al Ittihad in the uh, in the Saudi Pro League for about 60 million odd euros. Douglas Deweese uh, to Juventus, a move I literally until about an hour ago had no idea had happened. Um, <laughs> just completely passed me by, but that's a, a fun one for him um, to, to head off to Juventus and it felt like a big loss uh, for Villa. But I'll, I'll come to talk to you about that. Uh, Cameron Archer. Um, uh, 
on the younger side of his career off to Southampton for about 20 odd or 17 odd million um, and then I think just one more will do um, uh, it's probably like Tim Irogbun uh, off to Everton uh, for about 10, 10 odd million euros as well yeah I'm sure there's some others in there who, who had left were you, were you surprised by those top two I suppose then to the DRB and Louise um, leaving like that or did you just, did you just read it as good business to, to, to sell for those prices um, at that time yeah, uh, twofold answer to this, really. I mean, Villa always catching up with plenty of other teams in the Premier League in terms of their FFP and PSR standings uh, because they spent three years in the Championship between 2016 and 2019. You know, their revenues dropped, so when they came right. back into okay. the prem into the Premier League, it was it was always a difficult. It was always they were always playing catch up a little bit with with other clubs, so. They had to get everything right in those early years in terms of the big money signings that they made. They really had to work because they couldn't lose money on them. Um, and without going too much into detail, you know, Villa made a, a real clear plan of theirs to build out the academy and try and get some value in the players there, build them up, sell them on for a profit. And then obviously that will help their FFP, um, uh, you know, balance sheets, so to speak. So... It was a difficult one because PS, uh, the, the the profit and sustainability rules were, were really starting to pinch at, at, at Villa Park over the summer and they needed one big sale at least just to balance the books because they had ambitions to bring in players to improve the squad as well. So Douglas Louise was, was a player really that if they had had a bit more power um, and a bit more freedom in terms of their, their, their spreadsheets... They'd have, they'd have tried to keep him, but they had to let him go. And, he, and it wasn't a great deal, to be honest, because they let him go to Juventus. They brought two players in on loan and they've loaned both of those players. Uh, sorry, they brought two players in as well as £34 million. And both of those two players who they signed have gone out on loan now. So they've lost a key player and not really replaced him um, in that respect. They did bring Andre, uh, Amadou Anana in and uh, Ross Barkley. So those were two additions into the midfield. But with Diaby going, and yes, it was a deal that they couldn't really turn down because Diaby had a decent season last season, but he probably dropped in value, to be honest, because he didn't exceed expectations. So the money that they were offered, they, they couldn't really turn that down. But I do feel the wide positions now for Villa are weakened without him. Um, Jaden Philogene returned back to the club after a period uh, at Hall City, but at this moment in time, he's not quite as good as uh, Diaby. And unfortunately for Villa, Leon Bailey's form's dropped last, uh, in comparison to last season, so that's an area that, where they're struggling at the moment. And very, very briefly, the, the plan for, from Villa was to build a squad of sort of 19, 20 players, all of very similar stature. So if one player dropped out, another player could fill in very easily um, and that would help them sustain a run in the Champions League and the Premier League. But it's just starting to become a bit difficult for them because a lot of players are out of form. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. And um, in terms of the actual bulk, I suppose, of the spending, then uh, it came in the form of Amadou Anana, who came in from Everton for about 59 million or euros and, Ian Madsen, uh, of course, from, from Chelsea, but had that great loan spell out uh, at Dortmund, making it all the way through the, to the Champions League final. Um, a great sort of season for him to sort of go out and get that experience for about 44 odd million uh, euros. Um, two players there who I like the look of. I think, I think it has a sort of, again, the profile, 22 years of age, room to grow, room to improve. Um, from what I see of their performances, you know, talented young players. I wanted to ask you how you think both of those those players have settled so far and sort of their influence that they, that they managed to have. I know Anana has popped up a number of times with with some goals early on. Uh, and then also I wanted to mention as well, uh, there's another player who came in, um, it being um, Ross Barkley, just because I think it's interesting to see his his career trajectory at about 30 years of age, had that you know, promising season last, uh, last time around with Luton uh, and picking him up for about just like five million odd. Um, uh, pounds seems like it's a it's a, it's a good bit of business, but um, yeah, tell me about the I suppose the most high profile two, and if I've left any, any anybody out, feel free to to jump in. <laughs> sure, yeah. So uh, Anana came in with big expectations. I think he's improved Villa 
in the attacking areas. I think he's a real threat from set pieces, and that's a key area for Villa because they score more goals than any other team in the Premier League from set pieces and have followed up that pattern this season. So he's made a big difference there. I think they needed additional height in the team because they were a relatively short side, uh, certainly over the last few years anyway, so that's helped as well. He... He's been hit and miss, to be honest. So he's had some good games, some some bad. You know, tends to go, tends to start games well and then fade out a little bit. He's been taken off at half time um, on a few occasions and had a very good half against Tottenham in the first half, but was then poor in the second half. So still taking his time to settle in a little bit. The fans like him because. He has a real connection with them. There's like fist pumps that he does after every win. And, you know, I think that goes down quite well with them. In terms of Ian Matson, hasn't been able to fully integrate himself into the starting lineup yet, purely because Luca Dean's been playing so well. Um, I think Matson's the most used substitute in the Premier League, or John Durand is certainly one of the two of them. That it's, you know, the, the two the two players that you always expect to come on off the bench are Ian Matson and John Durand for for Villa. Um, and I think as you as you mentioned, Harry, you know, early early uh, young player, so early days for him. And Ross Barkley, I think he was just a, a good but a good bargain deal really you know a player who we didn't expect to ever see at Aston Villa again because he had a period at Villa Park on loan during the during the Covid season um the season where Villa beat Liverpool 7-2 so uh, there were some good memories and moments for him vaguely but... vaguely remember that yeah. <laughs> yeah it was a bad, bad decision for Liverpool wasn't it yeah um but uh the yeah he had some good moments but it faded off for him and uh, I think he needed to go and reinvent himself. So he had that time over in France and then performed well for Luton last season. And Uno Emery really liked the look of him. So he's a he's a player who's come in and, and just built the squad out a little bit. Yeah, no, it, seems, it seems like a really good move for him, actually, in his career to actually get that opportunity to be a, to be a squad player in, a, in such a high-quality squad that's going to be competing across many fronts this season. Um, and then I wanted to ask you, just, I suppose, ask you, um, more of a question around tactics. Did you think that um, there was anything that revealed itself last season that, that, that you imagined that it might lead to a slight change in approach this time round, or was it just purely around okay, what the approach that Emery took last season was working, was successful? We just need to make sure that the squad is uh, you know, packed enough that when when somebody goes out, someone else can come in and do exactly what they um, should be doing in the system. Yeah, I think you know it's very clear Villa play with the the high line and and still do that now. I, I did wonder whether that would start to become an issue for them and whether teams would would figure them out. But so far they haven't had that many problems yet. Um, and uh, the the I suppose the other sort of it's not really a tactic, but it's more a more a selection di- dilemma is. John Duran and Ollie Watkins as a pairing haven't really worked yet. They haven't started any games together, but for the periods where they've played together in the, in the second half of games for 35 minutes or 30 minutes or so, they haven't really shown much of a connection. And, and the last two games, defeats to Club Bruges and Tottenham, went pretty badly when the two of them were on the pitch. So that seems to be a bit of an issue for Villa at the moment because clearly both players deserve minutes but are unable to play together. And in terms of the performances so far this season, then I think it's it's been positive start in many ways, in terms of sort of how the how the league kicked off and also some of the performances in Europe. But I just wanted to ask you: I mean, are there any particular um, games that you think um, are a good reflection of Villa just picking up from where they left off last season, or particular highlights that you think are worth um, mentioning this season? And then may, maybe we can also then talk about um, some of the recent form and 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 the reasons behind some of those. Um, some of those losses, because I think you know, Villa come into the game on the weekend on the back of three consecutive losses, very unlike um, a new Emery side. At Sierra, discover joyous deals on great gifts for everyone on your list, like cozy slippers, ski gear, fishing poles, bikes, large kayaks, even larger canoes. Whew, which might lead to another discovery. <sighs> Robin Gifts is the only sport you need to stay fit this season. Tis the season to discover great gifts at unexpectedly low prices. Sierra, let's get moving. 
It's game time. And if you've got a hunch about this NBA season, you could turn it into a big win on FanDuel. Because right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $300 in bonus bets if you win. Ooh, that guy's hotter than a microwave burrito. Now that's a red-hot hunch. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Must be first online real money wager. $5 deposit required. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Today we have two very special guests on our program introducing Lem hey. and Lime. Hello. For Starry Lemon Lime Soda. Thanks for having us. What is Starry Lemon Lime Soda? It's a crisp, clear burst of lemon lime flavor and it's caffeine free. Between us, one of you must be a little more important to Starry than the other. Who is it? We're both important. So we could just as easily be Starry Lime Lemon Soda. No, that doesn't sound right. Oh, I like it. So you saying hip hop could be hop hip. Works for me. Starry Lemon Lime Soda. Starry hits different. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. Ha. This is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, Mac boxes and games consoles. Visit LibertyShield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Yeah, I mean, I suppose up until pretty much the the end of October, really, Villa were Villa were flying. They'd only lost one game uh, at home to Arsenal, uh, a game that they were, you know, expected to to struggle in. But all the other games were were either wins or draws, and there was that you know miraculous night, amazing night against Bayern Munich, Bayern where Munich, of yeah, where where it felt similar to the days of last year and and the previous year, where where Villa beat Arsenal twice and, and beat Manchester City once. Um, you know, real clear game plan to sort of just sit back a little bit, soak up pressure and, and hit Bayern Munich on the transition. And, and it worked so well. There, there were moments where they rode their luck, admittedly. But um, I do believe that, you know, good teams, they, 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 they earn their own luck, so to speak. So, so yeah, those, those opening months of the season were, were great for Villa. They occasionally went behind in a few games, but always managed to find a way back. I think they're the team who have... Behind Man City, they're the team who have recovered the most points from losing positions. Right. Um, so you know that, that's great for supporters who go to games because that, it, that it, there's, there's excitement there, and but there's belief. If they if they fall behind, they they feel like they're good enough to go and get back into the game. And they showed that against Wolves, showed that against Everton, um, and maybe a Fulham. I think they went behind it quite early at Fulham, and then. Went and won three one in in probably the best performance of the season. You know they were excellent away at, at, at Fulham on that game. So yeah. a good start to the season has just fallen off a little bit though. It was a quality actually that we, that we came to associate with Liverpool last season that uh, under under club wasn't it actually that very yeah. frequently they'd be going behind and you, you you come back and you you get late winners or you you come back and um, ultimately it wasn't sustainable and I think that I mean that's that's the reason why we've. I think gone in a different direction this season yeah. and, and, and don't like to be behind very often. Um, and that's, I, I mean, I much prefer that. I have to say it's easier on the heart, um, for sure, as it is for all the fans <laughs> yeah. who are there as well. Uh, in those positive performances, before we get on to some of the recent, the recent games and the recent run that Villa are on, the positive performances, and you mentioned Bayern being a highlight there, uh, a slight disappointment that the Bayern exertions probably prevented uh, Villa from them being able to go and beat Man United at the time because uh, it was... Uh, a game that came so quickly after, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that on a uh, on a different occasion. But you mentioned certain players who maybe been out of form, not quite replicating the performances that they put in last season. Have there been uh, other players that so far this season have had more prominent roles in the side? And yeah, you, you mentioned Anana and threat from set pieces, but 
who has stood up for Brazil so far this season? Yeah, I mean, it's um, sounding like a broken record when I say Emi, Emi Martinez has been performing well. Uh-huh. But, <laughs> you know, we have to mention him because he's just amazing. He he makes so many important saves. And, and again, in those early months and, and against Bayern Munich, he was brilliant. So um, shout out Emi Martinez. He just never, 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 ever drops in terms of his performances. But I suppose the main player really for Villa has been Yuri Tillemans in, in the middle of the, the mm. pitch. You know, the, this player who performed so well at Leicester but was then part of the relegation team um, at, uh, at the King Power Stadium and there were some question marks over whether he was good enough whether he wanted it enough um, the the the, uh, the stick that he was always beaten with um, in, in, when I was speaking to people who who uh, within the industry um, had scouted him previously were saying that he's just not quite dynamic enough he doesn't get up and down as, as much as we you know uh, other clubs would need from a centre midfielder but Villa saw something in him and you know Emery's you know, absolutely getting the best out of him just a, a lovely lovely footballer uh, the way he he dictates the play in the middle of the park an amazing array of passing um, and, and just such a controlled player you know feel like he is the star player for Villa so far this season. No, interesting. I was, I was, I was interested in how that move would go for him. And again, I think I heard similar stuff around his game. In, in that, that, would that lack of dynamism hurt him? But yeah. I think, I've, I've seen him get around quite, quite well. To be honest, in in those matches that become a bit more like basketball games, he he he, he is able to compete in that uh, in that situation. And I they, they want to, I suppose, bring it on to the. Let's talk. Let's talk Champions League first and foremost. As you mentioned, it, it, it's a competition that the club and those that at the top of the club do regard Villa as um, having a chance of of going all the way in. Uh, and I believe, I mean, I've actually forgotten what the, what the current table is. But is it is it are, are Villa second in the Champions? Or that they were second in the Champions League? Villa, they? yeah, Villa were Villa were first um, up until the last round of games, but because they they lost at Club Bruges, Bruges they they've now dropped down to eighth, which. That's um, crazy. <laughs> it just shows the fine yeah. margins, doesn't it? You know, one, one, one defeat, and and that's probably why you know Emery was so enraged yesterday. Um, I mm. was speaking to people close to him today, and and they they said that that was the uh, most uh, most heated he, he, he's uh, he's been since he's been at oh. Villa. Just just very 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 disappointed, um, because he knows that was a big opportunity for Villa. If they'd have won four out of four. They'd have been in an amazing position to um, to to go and qualify in the top eight, which which was privately um, an ambition and an aim when the Champions League started. But there was a bit of realist a uh, bit of realism there uh, within Villa that that there are a lot of very good, experienced teams in the Champions League. And finishing in the top eight is so difficult, but we you know we know with the new format, finishing eighth gives you a massive advantage because yes. you. Um, you you skip a you skip a double headed round effectively um, and go straight to the last sixteen. Yeah, any situation where you can not play football <laughs> games, games this yeah, season yeah. is, is yeah. very welcome. Uh, it's just <laughs> ridiculous how many there are. And uh, for those who didn't see the game, um, they may have seen the highlight of just, of course, a really strange concession of a penalty. Um, it was it was it was it was Tyrone Mings picking up the ball right, and then it was, yeah. deemed, it was deemed that that was active. Uh, and um, therefore handball and penalty. That that was it. Yeah, I mean, you know, Emery d- described it as the the biggest mistake that he's ever seen in his career. Right. Um, and and for, for those for those people that haven't seen it, basically what happened, Emmy Martinez kicked the ball out. Tyrone Mings was facing away from the ball, um, and as the ball trickled towards him, he just picked it up and placed it back in the in on the six yard line because mm. he thought that. He thought that the ball had just obviously been rolled in from yeah. perhaps from from off the pitch or whatever. Um, so yeah, a couple of things there. Feel really sorry for Tyro Mings. He's had a tough tw- thirteen months, fourteen months through injury. Um, this was his Champions League debut, and to end up making such a big mistake like that must have really hurt. So it wasn't an intentional mistake. You know, he clearly... <laughs> sorry, that sounds stupid, doesn't it? It wasn't an intentional mistake. Um, it wasn't an intentional thing. It was clearly a mistake. Um, and there's no way he would have done that on purpose. But at the same time, you can't really defend him because football players should be switched on. They should know where the ball is at all times almost. And... Um, and it just might be a lesson for for some of the Villa players that they have to stay switched on throughout each game now. 
Mm, yeah, very harsh way to yeah to, to to get your Champions League debut to yeah. end up making an error like that. But yeah, again, careless, but can you can imagine it could happen to to quite a few. Um, then looking at the recent run, then because of course Bruges was the very last game um, in the, in this recent run. So it was a, the the draw to Bournemouth um, at the end uh, at the end of October uh, or towards the end of October. Then there's the cup game against Palace, was so sort of an, an arrow loss there. And then a 4-1 loss to to Tottenham uh, in the Premier League, uh, and then followed by that 1-0 loss away to to Bruges. As I said, very rare for for Villa to go through these kind of patches. I suppose under Emery, although you did mention sort of towards the end of last season, things came yeah a little bit off the off the rails when when the club had already succeeded and got their sort of main goal achieved in terms of Champions League football. The, the, the performances weren't as good, but to to see a run of results like that is is surprising. Uh, you mentioned there Emery being very angry uh, after the Club Bruges game. Uh, I suppose the question I've got for you is how, how do you then think that's going to factor into his approach for um, the game on Saturday evening? It is a strange one, 8 o'clock on a Saturday night under the lights at Anfield. It's going to be a good atmosphere, you imagine. Um, mm. how, how, do you, how do you think he will approach that factoring in the recent form? Yeah, I think he's. I think there's going to be a little bit of caution, to be honest, because Villa have only lost three games on three on three occasions under Emery. So this is really unusual, sure. uh, unknown territory almost. Uh, Villa have never lost four in a row, um, and you know the, the form that Liverpool are in, you, you, you'd find it hard to think that Villa are going to get a result there, to be honest. But this all stems back from the the Bournemouth game. Villa were home and dry. I mean, it was 96 minutes. They had one set piece to defend. And then in the, in the 96th minute, they conceded. Um, it feels like they haven't really recovered from that. They they rotated the team for the the Carabao Cup game against Crystal Palace, which is fair enough because you know with a Champions League campaign, you need to give the, your fringe players the the minutes because the the main players are running low. But if you throw away a League Cup game like that when you're a club that haven't won a trophy for, since 1996 have to then go and win at the weekend to back that up and Villa were battered at, at Tottenham so it's a, it's a strange and awkward and an uncomfortable position for, for people at Villa right now because they just haven't experienced this for a while um, so I do think they'll go very much back to basics they'll try and become hard to beat at, at Anfield on, on Saturday night and then just try and use their um, their qualities in the transition Ball, ball carrying players in Watkins, Ramsey, or or Rogers to try and cause some problems, but I think you'll you'll find you know eight nine men behind the ball very often. Yeah, it's not it's, it's not a uh, um, a challenge that this this Liverpool team have tended to like. I have to say, I mean, even <laughs> even with their success of late, and I think at times, I'm not saying that uh, Xabi Alonso's Leverkusen were quite that. You know, quite that conservative, but yeah, I think I think it was very much a disciplined um, sort of shape and, and, and trying to figure out how to get through that, uh, which in the first half proved very difficult for for Liverpool. And it looks like it's just Matty Cash and is it Ross Barkley who might be out for this game? Yeah, those two, and it, it will be interesting to see what Liverpool do again against Villa if they do sit back a little bit deeper, because um, you know Arnis Lott has reiterated that. He he prefers to play against a. I don't think Villa will specifically be a low block, but he he prefers to play against a team with a low block because mm. he thinks that Liverpool's quality should shine through. Um, uh, when you know when they have so much ball possession and um, in in in, in great territory like that. But um, yeah, I mean, just just thinking back to the Brighton game against Liverpool, I could I could see that first half going quite similar to. To, to how Villa play in, in some respect you know they build up from the back quickly and then Paul Torres is always looking for you know the number 10s with with uh, defence um, line breaking passes so that was similar to what Brighton were doing and they had great joy didn't they in the first half against Liverpool and, and Liverpool yeah. came out and, and, and turned it around after the break so a really interesting match up I mean you know we Although Villa are in a bad run of form, you know we can't deny that they're still one of the best teams in in the division now. Awesome. Um, and uh, and 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 so yeah, uh, an interesting challenge. Yeah, I think Unai Emery as well. I think has has, has earned that reputation of he clearly does his homework ahead of each of these games, and and, and very often be a, a pragmatist in figuring out ways to exploit the weaknesses of the opposition. Right? I think I think it's always what yeah. he's been, been been very good at. Um, and so. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it feels like a tricky one because, as you said, they're coming off three consecutive losses, no, haven't lost four in a row. Um, and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> sure, surely it's going to be a bounce back there, Liverpool flying at the moment. It, it, interesting what you were talking about there around Arna Slot, uh mentioning that he actually prefers it when he's you know, Liverpool playing against a low block because he believes that they should uh, be able to play through that with their quality, with the superior amount of possession they'll have. I know you... You know, covering Liverpool as well for the Athletic. Um, do you share that view uh, based on the games you've seen so far this season? Because I, I, maybe it's just a bit of muscle memory from me and that Liverpool have never seemed to be super good at this and it, they do make hard work of that at times. It is difficult for any team, I think, to play to play through a well-organised low block. Um, I do prefer when the game breaks up a little bit and, and, and things become a little bit hectic and there's more spaces and I think Liverpool have plenty of muscle memory when it comes to that. But, yeah, just yeah. interested in your view. I mean, like, because of the games you've seen, does it, it's a lot might like it, but <laughs> yeah. do you think it's necessarily yeah. true? Like, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to, to go along with that. And th- to be honest, there isn't too much that, that Slot has said that I haven't um, disagreed with. You know, he, he certainly knows. He's an incredible tactician. He's got a very, very um, smart brain, a uh, smart mind, and he, he knows it. it, it uh, one of the smartest thinkers in the Premier League with some of the tactical changes he's made I've been really impressed with but yeah I'm I'm not entirely sure I, I think that Liverpool appear to be better when teams come at them a little bit and it gives them the space to uh, to, to, to then break forward and we are you know we are seeing slightly different changes in, in how they attack um, and build up you know Virgil van Dijk with more um emphasis on, on on starting up attacks that that's a new thing this season isn't it with those shorter sharp passes into into Gravenberg and 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 then sometimes McAllister uh, I think the underlapping runs that the that the fullbacks are, are now doing that to allow either well more so Salah but sometimes Gappo a little bit more space and, and freedom down the wings that's slightly different I think but yeah in terms of coming up against a low block I just think that to be honest, I think Liverpool struggle a little bit in, in those respects. Uh, they, they seem to find it hard to break down teams, but um, we shall see as, as the season goes on, because I'm sure mm. there'll be plenty of occasions that teams will, will, will play that way. Yeah, it is it, it is an interesting one, because I think well, I mean, endless games that Liverpool have watched at this stage, but <laughs> it, 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 it does appear to be something that we struggle with, and it, it appears that uh, there has been very specific profiles of players who have been good at, at working that out. I mean, I think in the past um, Coutinho years ago, um, even the likes of um, Thiago, um, when he was at Liverpool, sort of having that ability to sort of judge when he can quickly accelerate things and play through. Yeah. Uh, at, at the moment, it feels like you look at Liverpool's midfielders, and maybe Alexis has that kind of ability to combine with Salah and find a find a way through. But I, it doesn't look like they enjoy it. Let me put it that way. I think they'd much rather, <laughs> no, they'd much rather to have an open <laughs> game and like loads of space to to play into and I've enjoyed Slot talking about that recently where there's been some games where you go oh, it does look as though what's happened in some of these games is that the muscle memory of, of basketball matches on the clock is, is still there and at times they just see oh there's an opportunity and they and they go really quickly at opposition in transition and, and that's where they're having their having their joy but I have seen Slot also correct um, a number of pundits about he also likes that as well so um Based on what you see the Liverpool this season, you mentioned there one change of, of Van Dijk firing it into to grab uh, in midfield. One thing we saw, I think it was we saw Brighton do, um, or perhaps it was Leverkusen, one of the two uh, was, was was Mark actually uh, was actually man Mark Gravenberg, and yeah. um, there were a number of times where he tried to do that turn where he receives the ball and then just lets it run across him. And he yeah. wasn't really able to do it just because of the way in which it was Ayari was playing very well that, at, um, on the day. Um, and I'm looking at the, the team sheet here for, for Spurs and just looking at Onana, and I already have it in my mind. Do, do you think that uh, Emery might be tempted to do something similar and given the influence uh, Gravenberg has had this season? Yeah, I think I think so. He, he, uh, Gravenberg's been a little bit quieter, hasn't he, in the last two games for Liverpool? It feels yeah. like... Um, uh, opposition are targeting him a little bit yeah and look you know he's played a lot of minutes as well so perhaps at some point he's going to need a rest in in one of the big games because he's he's one of only four starters who's played in every single Champions League and Premier League games um, you know starters so 
it, it will be interesting because I think Anana drops a little bit deeper. So um, I'm not quite sure who Villa, who, who Villa would put on him. You know, perhaps McGinn even. Um, you know, if McGinn starts, he might be the the guy that has to that has to man mark him a little bit more. Mm. Um, it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm not I'm not too sure what that what they'll do or whether they'll even target him. But and I think doesn't... you think you're right though. Bright, Brighton and Leverkusen definitely they did definitely yeah. put an emphasis on him, didn't they? Yeah, it was interesting. I think I think was it Slobosh like got a rest against um, Leverkusen with, um, with with Jones coming in. So I, I imagine he comes back into this game and um, that off the ball running that he he provides. And there's going to be plenty of it in in this game. So that's going to be one for sure. Uh, just before we sort of get towards wrapping up, I want to ask you around. Do you think there's a key battle here in terms of you, you looking at the matchups, looking at sort of the areas of the pitch? Um, it feels like Salah's really pulling the strings at the moment for <laughs> yeah. multiple games, so it's going to be, you know, be a long day for the fullback. But I just want to um, get your get your view in terms of like, is there a particular kind of battle or area of the pitch that you think is going to be uh, going to be key? It could, it could be that midfield. Yeah, I think um, I think for Villa they need to get Watkins moving again because the last couple of games he's been he's been a little bit flat. So um, how how Van Dijk or Canate handle him, I think he's going to be the key because you know Van Dijk has had a couple of difficult days against him. You know the seven two game where he scored a hat trick and also um, as I mentioned previously, you know the, the Netherlands um, and, and England in the quarter in the semi finals where Watkins scored. So, you know, the Van Dijk hasn't got great memories against Watkins, and I think that'll be the main battle. I think it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting one. And John Duran, it is a, his his early season form and, and the influence you think he could have for Villa this season, I saw sort of like, was there a game where, actually where, where, where both of them, um, Ollie Watkins and, and Duran, were paired together and it, and it didn't quite work? Yeah, so they, they haven't started together yet, but the last two games they've played the last thirty to thirty five minutes and it hasn't right. and it hasn't worked at all for them. You know, Villa have actually got worse in games when the two of them have been together. So that's a real problem for, for Villa at the moment. They just can't they want to get both of them on the pitch but they can't really work together. So it's a it's a major dilemma. Um also with Duran that Emery's struggling to get instructions into him. He he doesn't He's not as tactically savvy as uh, Watkins, and he and he doesn't abide, uh, doesn't follow the orders as, as well as Watkins. So that's why Watkins starts so often ahead of him. But in terms of his attacking qualities, there's absolutely no doubt how how lethal he can be with the ball at his feet. The thing that's just letting Duran down at the moment is, is his all round game. He's not quite as much of a team player as the rest of them and when you play for a manager like Emery you have to be all in on that else you don't get by well, he should should take a leaf out of uh, Darwin Nunes' book where you basically <laughs> yeah. just sacrifice like, the, the number of shots you take and the goal just <laughs> yeah. to, to try and become that team player which I, I think, he's, I think he's, he's making strides in that area for sure I'm sure he's doing things that Slot wants him to do it's just the the stuff that he's paid to do as well I think is, 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 what's, um, is what's missing at the moment but you do hope that he he finds a return to sort of goal scoring form. And just one last question before we do wrap up, um, Greg is like, sure. Um, what do you then expect from this season then for, for Villa? It sounds like it's going to be about how well they can manage the squad and those deputies who come in um, for the first team um, uh, players, uh, how well they're able to perform in, in those games where Emery has to rotate. But uh, you mentioned earlier on the ambitions within the club of thinking they can go real deep into the European competition um, and, and the goal, I suppose, being that you know, to, to to ensure that the finish in the top four again. But right at the moment, what are your expectations? Um, yeah, I think uh, first and foremost, the short term aim is to is to get through this, uh, this this calendar year because the fixtures now coming up are really difficult for Villa. You know, they've they've had a, a nice, quite a kind start to the season, um, and I think that probably reflects on why Emery's so furious in the last few weeks because. They started so well, and they've they've a lot of that's gone to waste now. And coming up, you know, there's there's Liverpool on Saturday, then Juventus in the Champions League, then Chelsea, um, and then then you know Leipzig away, and then I think just before Christmas is, is Man City and Newcastle, with a few other games mixed in here and there. But th- there's a lot of tough games for for Aston Villa coming up now, so they've got to get through to the through the calendar year um, in pretty good shape. Try not to get any injuries um, or any key injuries, and then reevaluate from there. But 
mm-hmm. now they've had the taste of Champions League, they don't want to throw that away and they want to finish in the top four again. No, absolutely. I think it's once you're in the competition, I think it yeah, definitely becomes intoxicating. But um, <laughs> Greg, I want to really thank you for coming on, um, as always, and giving us your perspective on Liverpool, of course, but also on, on Aston Villa. Just before we do go, is there, was there anything that you wanted to to plug on your end at all? Or um, not at the moment. There is a there is a project I'm working on that I can't share any details okay. around. But um, hopefully in time, Harry, you can uh, you can help me promote that. <laughs> sure, redacted, redacted, redacted. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's coming. It's coming soon. Um, yeah. Uh, well, in that case, thank you again for coming on. Really, really appreciate your perspective. Pleasure. Thank you, mate. A big thank you, as always, to listening in to Rival Recon this week. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. And as ever, we'll be back again with another episode ahead of the Reds' next league game, looking to bring you greater insight into the world of Liverpool's Premier League opponents. Until then, do listen in to all the other great content across Anfield and Next. And if you're keen for more, subscribe to Anfield and Next Pro for the meagre price of a cup of takeaway coffee. Until next time, up the Reds. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.